Over a week ago, my friend and I were out on the town. Later that night, we drove up to the forest, about a mile up the hill and away from my house. It was about 9 p.m. when we arrived up there. It was a very strange night, to be honest. The moon was visible behind the clouds, and everything was very dark. We pretty much were just standing around for about 10 minutes next to my car, in the darkness, looking into the forest and having a smoke break. Then, the forest got super quiet. After that, a guy with a dog came by, but nothing unusual, right? Well, then it got even quieter. That's when I spotted some strange lights in the forest. Probably half a mile inside, between the trees. It almost looked like candlelight. We didn't have any snow by then. It had been about a week or two since we'd had any, so it wasn't that. I told my friend and pointed over to the lights. They just shrugged it off and told me that it was clear. It was probably a house in the distance. But it wasn't, because I knew for a fact that there was no house there. There was only one farther up the road, not over there in that area of the forest. I knew that forest well. We were looking at and watching it for a bit, until this really strange feeling hit us, as though we were being watched. We heard some leaves rattling and some branches cracking. Otherwise, those lights looked like they were coming closer. I could swear it. Then I started to feel like I was hearing some kind of voice from where those lights were. But I couldn't be sure. It was very strange. After finishing the smoke break, we got back in the car since it felt way too creepy. Just to kind of put everything at ease, I said, No worries, we're just visiting and we come in peace. I know you're out there. My friend just glared at me like I was a mad woman, knowing that at least one Wendigo and some other beings roamed around this forest. At least that's what the stories say. Well, nothing really eventful happened until afterwards. I went to bed the following night and I had a very strange, lucid dream. I could almost say it was astral for what it was worth. In the dream, I was going close to the forest, looking down to where the swamp was. It was a bright afternoon in the middle of winter. The snow was covering almost everything. Then there was a windigo. Now, there's one Wendigo that always appears in my dreams, but this one was different. It looked kind of like a bear's skeleton, with a skull. A big skull that looked strange and had antlers, and half a skeleton rotten like a corpse for a body. I stared at it, and it looked at me, and then just started running at me. The sound was deafening. You know that sound you hear after a loud explosion? It was like that but with white noise and static in my vision. A moment later, I was awake, looking around. I said, what the heck? And then turned around and went to sleep again. I fell asleep and I woke up to the same dream. But this time, I was really mad. The next thing I remember was me bolting toward it, bearing some unhuman wrath ramming my fist into its ribcage and tearing it apart. Moments later, I saw him fall apart, letting out some kind of screech. I later woke up and that was pretty much it. I don't know if the dream is connected to that place and what we saw, but something weird is definitely going on with that forest. My boyfriend and I absolutely adore hiking, and there are many places to go because we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11 p.m. at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We had both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, 
and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire path, it was actually very clean and stable. We started walking up the trail when we started talking about paranormal things. I know it was probably a terrible move on our side to talk about that sort of thing at night in the middle of the forest, but anyway. Now it is to be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones, and we were both being very observant as to where we were on the path. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we weren't on a trail anymore, or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail, and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking. But thankfully, he said no, because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. I truly believe if we had tried to backtrack, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill when thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down, terrified, and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. It was a really strange experience, and I don't really have any explanation. I just know in my gut that it's a really good thing we didn't turn around. I'm a 30-year-old man. Blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like Boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before, all of it going in through one earbud while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk, and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at the store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. 
I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear, either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks, in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift, to see and experience things that were, I guess, paranormal for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences, and me, being not the bravest person on earth, would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened, someone would die, or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze, and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members. But nothing. Just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me, but long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out, and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation, but the fact that she died a while after really scared me, and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me. I've dealt with the paranormal side ever since I can remember, but this is the story that happened in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. My wife and I moved in sometime in September of 2014. We bought the home at auction, and it needed a lot of work. The home was built in 1969, and it was all original to that date, even down to the shag carpets. The house sat on 12 acres, with only three acres cleared around the home, other than some random trees. The rest was fully wooded. The basement was gross and musty. The ceilings were low in places, with the pipes and ductwork running throughout. It had an odd feeling when walking down there. The previous owners left a deep freezer, and what they had inside of it made me question the things they were doing in the basement. The freezer was full of different animal carcasses that had been stripped of meat, random bone pieces with bits of fur still attached. There was also a gallon bucket sitting in there, just full of blood. 
Our very first night staying there, my brother and sister decided to stay over with us. We were all hanging out anyway, and it got late, so they just decided to stay. While we were there, we were unpacking boxes and decorating for Halloween. I started walking the empty boxes and totes down to the basement, and while down there, something caught my eye. I saw what looked like a slim box sitting on top of the ductwork. I walked over and pulled the box down, and sure enough, it was an old 70s Ouija board. Not thinking too much about it, I grabbed it and brought it upstairs and sat it in our dining room hutch for decoration. The night was getting late. We were all getting tired. It had to have been around midnight. We decided to head up to the second floor and go to bed. All the bedrooms were dispersed on the second floor. My wife and I took the master bedroom and my brother and sister took rooms of their own. We laid there trying to doze off when suddenly we heard what sounded like the closet doors sliding and slamming shut, and the sound of running and stomping back and forth in the hallway. My wife had me get up to tell my brother and sister to stop and that we were trying to sleep. I get up and I go to each of their rooms and I ask what they're doing and that people are trying to sleep. They said, we thought it was you guys. I decided to grab my gun thinking, okay, maybe somebody broke into the house. I slowly walked downstairs, clearing each room as I went along. My wife, brother, and sister followed behind with a gun of their own. We cleared every room, but there was no one in the house. Suddenly, it dawns on my sister. It's the Ouija board, she said. I quickly grabbed it from the hutch cabinet and took it back to the basement and it was silent for the rest of the night. As time went on, the spirit was making itself known. We would have to block the basement door shut because we were constantly finding it open. Anytime we had to go down into the basement, we felt its presence. This thing was demonic. We would hear it walk up to the second floor and walk around the bedrooms. Doors would randomly slam shut. The lights would surge randomly. I began to see this dark shadow figure. It wasn't just any spirit. It was dark. Like I said, it felt demonic. I felt like I was losing my mind. Voices were constantly in my head. Sometimes they were whispers. Other times they were louder, but they always sounded muffled. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying, but it was all the time. The only time the voices weren't in my head was when I wasn't home. We had chickens and a sheep that died for no reason. All of our vehicles constantly had problems, down to the mower. One day I was putting laundry away. I had the windows open to catch a summer breeze because our HVAC didn't work very well. And I heard a strange sound. So I looked to the window and listened. It was coming from the right side, inside the woods. It got closer and closer, and then that's when I saw it. It was either a hellhound or a werewolf or something like that, walking through our front yard and disappearing into the woods on the other side. I was so shocked. One random night, we were watching a movie. The light surged and we heard the basement door slowly opening. I jumped up and wedged the door shut with a chair. Another night, I walked past the basement door to find it open, with no lights on, and I heard my wife down there calling my name. I thought it was really strange. Something just seemed wrong about it, so I didn't go down there. Then, I heard walking above me. Slowly, I walked up the stairs to the second floor, and I made my way up them. When I turned the corner, I found my wife in our room. She was the one that was walking upstairs while I was hearing her call me from the basement. I told her about this, and we both thought it was really wild. I mean, what did it want me in the basement for? The presence continued, and it was making us feel on edge. Tired, I was hardly sleeping. I tossed and turned, and the voices grew louder and louder. Yet I could never make out what they were saying. 
After a few years, we decided to put the house up for sale. My father-in-law was coming over to help work on a few things before the house hit the market. While he was there, the door slammed shut and the voices started in his head. He even said that he couldn't make out what they were saying. Eventually, we moved out and the voices, which had never been present before that house, went away entirely and have never come back since. While I do believe in the supernatural and paranormal phenomena, I am still the sort to look for a logical explanation to things. I do believe that whatever gives humans that spark of life remains after the body gives out. I also believe in the possibility of elemental spirits, spirits far older than humanity that are connected to the earth itself, like the Fae. We were over at my in-law's house in Charlotte, North Carolina this past Saturday. And while I sat at the dining room table, chatting with my mother-in-law, out of my peripheral vision on the left side, I saw and felt something whiz by me. It was at least 12 inches in length, maybe longer, with spindly arms and legs and a thin body. I only saw four appendages, two arms and two legs, for lack of a better word. There were no wings that I could see, and while I wouldn't really say that it was anthropomorphic, the arms and legs were positioned in a way that I would imagine them to be if someone were to lift a person in the air in a harness to fly them, hanging to the front and bent to the back. This thing had a head that was elongated and slightly rounded, oval-shaped, so it was longer than it was wide, but I didn't see any facial features. The best thing that I can compare it to would be a giant stick bug with only four legs, but I am 100% certain that this was not an insect. There's no way something that large would have been in the house without anybody seeing it sooner. Plus, my mother-in-law has two cats that are prolific bug catchers. Has anyone ever encountered anything like this? When I saw it, the word fairy immediately came to mind, though I've never been one to believe in fairies. I'm just baffled as to what it might have been. I know I didn't imagine it. It was definitely there, and I heard a soft whoosh as it passed. Any thoughts would be appreciated. Thanks to the lockdown, I had lots of time to clean up my house. As I was cleaning out a filing cabinet, I stumbled upon a manila folder full of old ticket stubs from attractions around Southern California. I had held on to them as keepsakes. I came across a pair of Knott's Berry Farm ticket stubs from January 31st of 2009, the birthday of my girlfriend at the time. I was caught off guard when I saw these, because I know for sure that we went to Disneyland for her birthday, not Knott's Berry Farm. We had our pictures taken in front of the Sleeping Beauty Castle. I bought a scale model refrigerator magnet of the castle, and I have both. We bought ride pictures from Space Mountain, Thunder Mountain, and a few other rides. We went to the Haunted Mansion, but we had wished that we visited in October when it was really decked out for Halloween. We even watched the fireworks show and Phantasmic toward the end of the night. For five or six years until we broke up, my girlfriend and I would talk about all the fun times that we had at Disneyland for her birthday. Like I said, I still have the refrigerator magnet, the physical photos we purchased, and the photos that we took that day on an old pre-SSD external hard drive. We have never been to Knott's Berry Farm together. I haven't been to Knott's Berry Farm since I was in high school, so I don't have any memories of that amusement park within the last two decades. I'm in my late 30s. 
Even stranger was that I could not find my ticket stubs for Disneyland at all. I went through that manila envelope several times, as well as the filing cabinet, looking for those ticket stubs, but I couldn't find them. So where in the world did those tickets come from? And where did the Disneyland ones go? I don't know if this is some kind of glitch in the matrix or what, but it really freaks me out. When I was 20 and in the army, I was sent to my first duty station in Germany. The barracks we lived in were converted old five-story buildings that were supposedly once the headquarter buildings for the Nazi party. From what we were told, the basement of the building that I lived in had been converted into our armory. However, it had supposedly once been filled with ovens and gas chambers. Apparently, a lot of people died in that building. There were all kinds of underground tunnels below our caserna that had outbuildings on base that, of course, were off limits, but that, of course, we snuck into anyway. Aside from the underground tunnels, the building that we lived in was super creepy. I was on the very top floor. My friends and I would be in a room watching a movie, and the doors would just fling open. We all had really strange experiences. I would always get woken up regularly by something nudging me and calling my name. I would wake up and see figures in my room and hear footsteps in the attic above my room almost every night. It became normal for me. As I'm writing this, I'm getting creeped out. My Google mini home device just started talking to me out of the blue and said, I like it better when you ask me questions. Okay then, moving on. So one night around 2 or 3 a.m., I am woken up by a nudge, and I see all these lights on in the hallway from under the bedroom door. Then I hear tons of people walking in the hallway, like a crowd of people. I thought, what the heck, are we having an alert? Alerts are random deployment readiness inspections very early in the morning. I thought maybe we had one and nobody told me. I throw on my uniform and open my door, and it's completely dark. No lights are on. Nobody's in the hallway. I thought I was going crazy. It's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. I really just stood there in shock. I had no clue what was going on, so I just went back to bed thinking I'd lost my mind. I never told my friends because I didn't want them to think I was losing it. I thought I was losing it. I guess it could all be attributed to dreaming, sleepwalking, half-dream kind of things. I mean, I know there's a reasonable explanation for everything, right? But honestly, in my heart, I know those barracks were haunted. My great-grandfather built this cabin in Michigan in the Upper Peninsula in the mid to late 1950s. The cabin's kind of run down, but kept up well enough that a lot of family members still go up there to this day to just relax and unwind, hike through the forest, or even do some fishing on the lake. I've only had a couple of experiences with this place, but they have stuck with me for years. The first takes place many, many years ago when I was just a kid. The cabin has two bedrooms. The biggest is usually designated for the adults or couples while the kids get the smaller rooms where a couple of bunk beds have been set up. On this night, I'm sleeping alone in the kids' room and it's raining hard. We're talking thunder, lightning, wind. It was a lot. I was having a hard time sleeping and was just on the edge of finally passing out when suddenly, bam, someone, something, whatever, had slammed into the wall right next to my bed. It was so loud that it startled me awake. You might think, oh, it's a log cabin, the wood was just settling, or, oh, it was probably wind from the storm. One, I asked several family members, and they have all told me that the cabin is solid as a rock, 
and if the wood is settling, there's no reason it would make that loud of a noise. Two, the wall was inside the cabin. It shared a wall with the living room. Also, this same incident happened to me several nights in a row like that. Middle of the night, bam, and it would scare me awake. This second incident involves my parents and I. We're a small family. I have no brothers or sisters. Also, this cabin is on a fairly large plot of land. There's at least three miles between us and the next property. So when I say we were alone, I mean we were alone. My mother and I were sitting at the kitchen table while my father was cooking breakfast. The kitchen is open to the table, and my mom and I were just watching my father cook while we were all chatting. There was a lull in the talking, and I hear a man's voice coming from the attic. At first I thought it was my dad or that I was just going crazy, but I didn't see my dad say anything. And when I looked at my mom, she had the same terrified expression on her face that I probably had. I don't know what the man said, and neither does my mom, but the thought of that voice more or less calling down to us from the attic freaks me out to this day. The cabin is still great though, and whatever is there doesn't seem evil. It just likes to make its presence known from time to time. I live about a mile or two from an old abandoned school that is very haunted. I've heard a few stories about it, and I have an experience there that I would like to share with you. It's a relatively short story, but it freaked me the hell out. I pass this school every time I drive home from work at night, and one night I got home pretty late, like around midnight. Anyway, I was passing the school, and there was a dead cat in the road. I turned around and pulled over in front of the intersection, directly across from the school. I had a friend with me, and we'll call him Chance. We got out of my truck and examined the body of the cat. As I was walking over, I looked up at the school just for a look, just seeing if I saw anything because of how late it was. I didn't, and we continued on to the cat. What we saw was pretty gruesome, I'll spare you. But I went back to my truck and grabbed some wipes I had tucked behind the front seat. It's a single cab, so I put things back there that I don't always need up front. Anyway, I put a few in the palms of my hands, completely covering them, so that I could safely pick up the cat and move it to some bushes to the left of the intersection. Chance and I walked back to the truck without glancing at the school a second time, until we were back in the truck putting on our seatbelts, in shock because of what we'd just seen. But it gets worse. I glanced at the school one more time before putting it in drive, and there was a man and a woman standing directly in front of the school, just standing there, staring at the school while holding hands. Chance is looking at his phone, so I tap his shoulder to get his attention. I say to him, bro, look and we just freeze for a second. I didn't see them at all when I glanced at the school before, and I would have at least seen them walking toward the front of the school when I had first walked over to the cat. The school's pretty wide, and it takes a minute to get to where this couple was standing. They just appeared out of thin air. Once that hit me, I put it in drive and drove up the road to the point where I could turn around and start heading home. Creeping by the school intersection, we looked to see if they were still there, and they were. As we passed the intersection, the man turned around quickly and stared directly at us. I have never floored my truck as hard as I did that night. I actually spun the tires when I took off. We made it back home in no time and pulled into the driveway and just sat there for a minute, contemplating what we'd just seen. Eventually, we got our wits together and went in, and Chance asked if he could just stay the night, and I agreed. I didn't want to go past that school again, so I didn't want him to. This happened over a month ago. Chance and I have had a falling out, and I haven't had any more experiences driving past that school. 
but that incident still messes with me to this day. This one day, I had a really weird experience by a school. I spent the beginning of that day at the rundown school's basketball court. Everything about it was odd, but fun. I was enjoying myself, and I was new to the city, and so my neighbor and I were just walking around. You know that saying, time flies when you're having fun? Well, that's exactly what it was. Due to my home life, it was easy for me to pick up on the vibe of the area. And when it changed, it got dark really fast. The vibe of that basketball court went from fun and happy to, I guess the right word would be sinister. Like the air itself was heavier. My neighbor called my name and I walked over. He was trying to introduce me to some group of guys. But before I got over there, I've already peeped out that he's nervous. The guy that's doing all of the talking is trying to tell me how the area worked and how the groups were and how you had to belong somewhere and had to prove yourself. He gives us this ultimatum and said that my neighbor and I had to fight and that whoever won basically would have a chance to try out for this group and no wasn't an option. I was nervous and scared, but I was surrounded and I didn't know what to do. Anywhere that I could have run, I would have been cut off by someone. The only thing that my mind could think of was that I needed help. They walked us to the school at gunpoint, and this whole time, this guy is in a full-on monologue. Now, we're by some lockers, and we were cut off with no exit, when all of us heard this growling, loud growling. A very large dog, about the size of a Great Dane, came out from the dark area of the hallway we were in. There was really no way it could have gotten over there that I could see. At first, these guys were acting like gangsters, but they were terrified of the dog. And if I thought the air was heavy at first, it felt like gravity was absolutely weighing me down now. Everything stunk all of a sudden. I couldn't move. I was just standing there. And it seemed like everybody was now standing behind me and this dog had come up beside me. I couldn't see it very well. My eyes were blurry from tears. When it jumped, the two guys with guns started shooting. Only thing I could think to do was fall and get up and run. I thought I was shot, so I'm running through this wooded area, but I was too afraid to stop because I thought I'd die if I did. I made it home, and my shirt and pants had blood on it, but it wasn't mine. I stayed in the house for a couple of weeks, hiding, expecting police to come and question me. I told my dad, but he didn't care. About the third week, that same neighbor and his mom knocked on the door. He came to apologize and told me that it was a setup. His leg and chest and arm were bandaged, and he said it was the dog. The guy that had done all the talking had passed away. Both he and the other person with the gun shot at each other. The dog did the rest. The dog caught up with him while he was running through the wooded area, after me. He said he was asking for forgiveness because he couldn't sleep, that every time he tried he could hear that dog growling, and he was afraid to walk outside because he could hear it. We never spoke again after that day, obviously, no matter how many classes we had together. I found out later that year that the school we were at was abandoned and was widely considered haunted by the locals. I went there on the regular to see the dog often. It was really the only place that I could get peace from home and the rest of the world. Never got too close to it, but I never really felt like I was in danger either. After all, that dog saved my life. I was in the first grade when the librarian read us a story about a king whose daughter suffered from nightmares. He sent for a dream catcher or a wizard 
who could heal the princess from her traumatic dreams. I don't remember the details of the story, but I remember that the wizard could eat the bad dreams if you recited a certain phrase. My imagination came to life that night, and I will never forget it. I have not completely written off the following experience as all just a dream at 39 years old. I don't know how much of it was imagination and how much of it was something else, but it's still a cool story. I remember waking from a nightmare, which I had often, and I would usually run off to my mom and dad's room. This time, instead, I recited what I had learned. Dream catcher, dream catcher, please come eat my bad dreams. And then I hid under my covers, waiting. Soon I felt movement at the end of my bed, making its way to my pillow. I could see the shadow of this being as I poked my eyes out from under the blanket. It was long and caterpillar-like in shape, about the size of a very large cat. My pillow lifted, and then it slowly crawled down the bed. At this point, I was absolutely terrified as I held my breath. I couldn't believe this was happening. As soon as I felt the thing leave my bed, I ran to my mom and dad, screaming that something was there. Of course, nothing was out of place when inspected by my parents. I've never had sleep paralysis in my life, which is what most people chalk this experience up to be. I vividly recall the sound of my blankets as the thing moved, and the lifting of my pillow, which caused my stomach to drop. I don't know if anybody else has ever had something similar happen. I don't know if I took what I had learned from a storybook and actually called in some kind of demon, but whatever it was, I'll never forget it. When I was 15, my parents made the decision that they wanted to build their own farmhouse in the southern pasture, doing away with the mistakes of our old house and improving on a few concepts. I, being the mountain boy that I was, was ecstatic. I no longer had to drudge a half mile to my trap line, a mile down, a mile back, and a half mile to the house, and then get ready for school. The trap line would be 200 yards from my front door. All big projects start somewhere, and ours started with water. See, we always had a problem with iron water at our old house. It stained everything, changed how the food tasted, and God forbid you had anything white. So Dad borrowed a bulldozer and an excavator off of a friend for a few days, built a sturdy road down to the bottoms, and dug footers for the house. But first, we had to see if we could get a good well on the property. It's well known that a certain sect of my family could witch water and had an old drilling truck. But first, silver had to cross hands, a jug of good shine had to be shared, and the rest poured out afterwards. My sister and I would see if we also had the gift. My cousins came down and checked the land with three things, a fresh forked peach limb, a pure silver pocket watch, and finally, a set of heavy copper wires bent into an L. The peach limbs marked the prospects, the watch pole told the depth of the water, and the copper told of its purity. Us kids had to stay up on the hill until they were done, and one by one, we were called down and instructed how to find water and mark it. My sister was down there about a half an hour, and then I got the call. When I went down, I was given four flags, instructed how to do it, and set out with a peach limb. Where it pulled the hardest, I marked the spots while my dad and the cousins looked on from the truck. I was next given the pocket watch and was told to tell them which one pulled the hardest. After that, I was given the copper tines and told to tell which one crossed the quickest. After much testing, I came up with the one weaving down through our sugar maple patch where we made maple syrup. Well, apparently I was dead on, and I was congratulated by all attending of my gift. But I digress, on to the creepy part. The next day, 
They brought the rig up, trimmed some trees so they could stand it up, and started drilling on my spot. At 50 feet, they hit water unexpectedly. Short job, right? Well, Dad had talked them into drilling a few holes in the creek through the bedrock so he could blast a few big holes in the creek for trout and a swimming hole. He had already cleared out a road down to the creek and cleaned off a section of bedrock, diverted the creek to the other side, and prepped them a spot to drill. The creek is probably 30 feet wide from bank to bank and is easily crossed dry-footed on dog days, but never goes completely dry. They take the rig down, drive it through the pasture, turn it around and back it out on the bedrock. Dad took the dozer and was clearing off a section on the other side of the pasture, and I was watching him for about an hour or two when my cousins come running up to my dad, yelling for him, saying he had to come, and pulling them back up the bank. The cousins were saying that he wasn't going to drill any more holes in the creek bed. Some words were exchanged and Dad backed the dozer down, hooked up the rig, and dragged them back into the pasture. The weirdest thing was, they then set up the rig 50 yards from the creek and started drilling a test hole. When they got about four lengths down, they pulled it up, and went back another 50 yards and drilled another, finally satisfied in what was going on. I, on the other hand, had walked around them and walked down to the creek to where they had just drilled. Dad couldn't turn all the creek against the hillside, not enough backfill and too much bedrock. What I saw was a drill hole down through the rock with a small stream of water disappearing into it. Come to find out, they had hit an underground cavern at six feet, and it just went. It extended about 50 yards out into our pasture, and maybe another 40 yards beyond that. We had to rearrange where we were going to put the house it came so far. We went back down to the creek with a tape measure. The tape measure maxed out, so we got a hundred foot tape and put it down. It maxed out. We got a spool of baler's twine, tied a rock to it, put it into the hole, and we all sat there for half an hour while Dad fed that twine down into the hole off the spool. Finally, he said screw it and cut the twine. He just looked at us and said, it's too damn deep. He gingerly drove the dozer back into the creek, smoothed everything up, covering the hole, and that was it. Dad passed away seven years ago this October. I walked down to the creek and fished it this spring for a mess of brookies. The creek changed and scraped itself clean in a few sections in the spring. One of the places it scraped clean was the bedrock where the hole is. Water is still flowing down that hole all these years later and it is never filled up. I grew up in Monroe, Washington, about 45 minutes northeast of Seattle, a small, quiet town with mostly woods and forests around it. I grew up and my mom and cousins used to always tell me a story about a man they called the grocery bag man. The name is exactly what it sounds like. A creepy man in a trench coat, always carrying around one bag in each hand. This wouldn't be scary except for the fact that all of our houses were spread pretty deep in the backwoods, miles from downtown, where you would get groceries. Every single one of my family members would see him around their respective homes, usually early in the mornings. I never believed in this guy. I thought it was a joke. When I turned 16 and I could drive, I would always spend time with friends in and around the backwoods of Monroe. One night, I was driving to my friend's house who lives about 10 miles out of town in a deeply secluded area. It's hilly. There are no sidewalks and you never see people out. In order to get to this house, you had to drive into town from my house and then back up another back road. As I drove down around 11 o'clock at night, I finally see grocery bag man. One bag in each hand, trench coat, long and creepy disheveled hair. When I passed him, 
I swear he stared straight into my soul. I speed to my buddy's house for a little party, and I'm telling my friends about what I saw and the story that my family used to tell me. Of course, I'm being made fun of because nobody believes me. I eventually say, screw it, and stop trying to prove to them that there's this creepy dude haunting the old roads. At about two o'clock in the morning, we decide to drive into town to get some jack-in-the-box food, as high school boys tend to do. We all pile into my buddy's truck and start driving out of his neighborhood development. As we hit the stop sign to turn onto the main roads, I kid you not, grocery bag man slowly walks past our car and continues down into the abyss. Needless to say, they weren't making fun of me anymore. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Etal, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single room all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway, I remember almost feeling as though I had walked into a wall of sorts, of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing her. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that the wing of the hotel was odd at least. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about 2 a.m., I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming dark shape was visible. It was darker than the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only to find that absolutely nothing was there. The window was locked from the inside. There was nobody in the closet or in the bathroom, and my room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night scared, playing on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned the light on, there was nobody there. It was just such a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I didn't get to experience anything after that. But I think I'm alright with that, because it still freaks me out to this day. I had to do my practice in my school as a librarian for three months. Every morning, I used to sweep and mop the library floor and then start to arrange the books on the shelves. Then I would key in all of the new book entries on the computer. I had the habit of bringing a bottle of holy water with me, and I would place it on the table where I sit. Since it was the major exam month, the library would be lonely, as the students and the teachers would be going back from school to their houses after one paper that day. Only some students and teachers would come to the library to study and borrow books. Most of the time, though, I would be alone in the library, so I would play some music as I arranged the books on the shelves. One day, as I was taking the log books out from the drawer, I accidentally spilled some holy water on the floor. To my shock, that area started to smoke a little. Although it was hard to see with the naked eye, I sensed that something was amiss in the library that day. 
As soon as I got up, in shock, the media room doorknob behind me started to twist and turn frantically. I stood in my place and looked over the counter to check if someone was there. I saw a shadow at the bottom of the door. I rushed out of the library and walked over to the media room, which was just next door to the library, and turned the doorknob slowly. It was locked. No one could have been in there. So whose shadow did I see? About eight years ago, when I was 13, I was up until 3 a.m. playing Xbox online, as you do. I remember feeling a little peckish, and I wanted some late night cereal, so I finished my game and went to go grab something to munch on. I turned on the hall lights and checked on my little brother, who was nine at the time, and my little sister, who was five. Being the oldest sibling, it was just something I would do. They were both fast asleep. As I got to the top of the staircase, I started to hear a little girl talking to herself. It completely creeped me out, but I thought maybe it was my sister sleep talking. But then it was even clearer, and I could really hear the sound of this girl's voice, and it was not my sister. I heard the voice coming from downstairs, and I got this horrible, sickening feeling inside my stomach. I got on my knees on the top of the staircase, and put my head down the stairs a little to hear the voice clearer. Then I figured that the voice was coming from the kitchen. Maybe she sensed I was there, because after that, when I tried to hear her even clearer, she laughed and I heard footsteps run off. I absolutely freaked out and ran into my mom and dad's room, telling them what had happened, but they both just told me to go back to bed. Needless to say, I did not get that bowl of cereal or sleep much that night. It was only a few weeks ago, now that I'm 21, that my mom has told me about the little girl who lives in our house. She says she feels her presence every now and then, mainly at the bottom of the stairs, which makes sense, as our two dogs now and our old dog used to stare up the staircase at nothing and sometimes bark like crazy. To this day, when I watch TV, I sometimes feel her looking at me from the stairs, although I've never heard or experienced anything quite like I did when I was younger. This happened about nine or ten years ago but it's something that I've never figured out, and maybe something I'll never figure out, but it has stuck with me all this time. Let me preface this by saying that I do get sleep paralysis. I've had more instances of sleep paralysis than I can count, but I'll say an average of four times a year for the past 30 years. Some years it's more often, some years it's less, but by the time this experience occurred, I was well versed enough to be able to identify when it was happening and to be able to pull myself out of it. Generally, when I get sleep paralysis, I can hear everything around me, but I can't move or make a noise. I've never seen the old hag, and only once have I seen the man in the wide-brimmed hat. He had red eyes when I saw him. And yes, he was pushing down my chest. Not cool, not fun, I never want that to happen again, but I also knew that he wasn't real as it was happening. So about 1% of the time I've had a visual hallucination. Usually it's just that I can't move or speak, but I can hear everything around me, and somehow I can see the room even though my eyes are closed. But this? It doesn't fit the mold of sleep paralysis, at least not in any way I've ever experienced it. That's why it bothered me so much then and why it still bothers me now. My son was young at the time, five or six. My then husband, now ex, and I drove to visit my grandmother for Christmas. She lives about a hundred miles away from me. She has two extra bedrooms, but other family members scooped up the extra rooms before we could. 
So my husband and I rented a hotel room a few miles from her house. It was something like a Best Western or Holiday Inn. If I had to guess, I would say at the time it was less than 10 years old. We checked into our hotel room quickly, dropped off our stuff, and went straight to my grandmother's house. We had Christmas dinner with the family. I don't think I had any alcohol at all. If I did, it might have been one glass of wine. It was a long drive down to her house, two hours at least, and then an eventful evening, so we were beat. We left Grandma's house at about 9 p.m. and headed back to the hotel room. We drove around for an extra 20 minutes, trying to get our cranky son to sleep, which made me even more exhausted. The exhaustion is the thing that had me thinking, maybe this was sleep paralysis, because that usually does trigger it for me. But again, what happened next is like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. The layout of the room is this. The hotel room door opened up to a little hallway, and directly to the left was the bathroom with a tiny closet next to it. Moving just past the hallway, the wall on the left turned 90 degrees and the beds were to the left. To the right, you could follow the wall straight to the corner. There was a dresser along that wall and in the corner was an armchair. From that corner, follow that wall and there was a window facing the parking lot. In the next corner, there was another armchair maybe three feet from the head of one of the queen beds. That was where my husband and I slept. My husband slept on the side near the armchair, and I slept on the inside so I could be closer to our son in the other bed. My son fell asleep in the car. I tucked him in and very quickly got changed and got in bed. My husband got in bed only moments later, and I shut the lights off. Before I fell asleep, I observed that the light from the parking lot peeked in over the top and around the sides of the window curtain. It was brighter than I would have imagined with the curtain drawn, but I was too exhausted for it to bother me, so I passed out pretty quickly. Sometime in the middle of the night, I hear the click of a door handle turning. It was the lever kind. I was alarmed, but my body was still heavy with sleep. I'm also facing the direction of the door. I watch as the orange light from the hotel hallway slides across the wall opposite of me and then slowly disappears as the door closes again, quietly. I felt like I was passing in and out of sleep, so the sight of this almost had a strobing effect. A young man wearing medium blue baggy jeans and no shirt walked past the ends of our beds. At this point, I'm more alert but I'm laying in bed trying to figure out if this is real or not. It was so vivid. But I also had this feeling that I was still passing in and out of consciousness. From the moment I heard the click of the door handle, I was scared out of my mind, but still so tired. I wanted to get up. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't tell what was holding me in bed, whether it was fear or exhaustion. At this point, the man is behind me. I can feel him looking at me, but I'm absolutely terrified to turn over. If I turn over, will it spook him? Will he attack my family? Right now, I can tell he's not moving, just looking. I finally feel alert enough and I realize my eyes are closed. What? But I can feel him in the room. I saw him even though I had no way to. It was the scariest thing I've ever done because I knew I might be facing an attacker in my hotel room, but I forced my eyes open and turned over. Nothing. There's no one in the room. My heart is racing. I mean, Jesus, that was so real. I look at my husband and he's fast asleep with his back turned to me, snoring gently. My son is asleep. Everything is how it was when I fell asleep. I'm still on my back, looking at the armchair in the corner at the end of the beds, with the soft white light of the parking lot falling onto the chair as I calm down enough to fall back asleep. I can't tell you how much time passed, but it was dark. And then, all of a sudden, I see the armchair in the corner at the foot of the bed again. 
but this time, the man that had entered the room earlier was sitting in it. With the light shining from the window, I can see him a little bit better. It's a soft light, but I can tell his hair is buzzed short, and it's a dark brown. He looks young, maybe 18 to 25. He's either white with a tan or perhaps Hispanic. I can't see his facial features too well, but he could be a model. I don't know celebrities well enough to be able to compare him to somebody, but he had strong cheekbones, sort of a perfect straight nose, and a strong jaw. Like I said, it was too dark to see the details, but this is what I gathered from his silhouette. He was just sitting there, calmly staring at me. He didn't feel threatening or menacing, but I was still scared out of my mind, because there's a guy in my room in the middle of the night staring at me. This time, the line between asleep and awake is even blurrier in my head. Am I asleep? Are my eyes even open? I don't know, but I'm afraid to find out. I can feel my husband asleep next to me, so I decide the best move is to try to discreetly wake him. He's still snoring with his back turned to me, but my hand is on the bed next to his back, so I decided to slowly move my hand closer and poke him. I poked him a few times, but he's passed out and not reacting at all. I was so pissed. I mean, he was dead to the world. Finally, I decided, F this. I'm not dealing with this alone anymore. So I turned toward my husband slightly, and I lift myself onto my elbow. This is where I'm sure I'm awake, but everything before that was blurry. I was about to grab his arm and shake the hell out of him when I noticed the man in the corner, in the chair, is no longer there. Now I feel crazy. I mean, what's going on? Where is this guy? Is he real or not? I was so tired, frustrated, confused, and scared. This man felt real. The details were so vivid. But as I'm trying to sift through what was real and what wasn't, I realize I can only see or feel this guy when I'm asleep. I pray to myself that this is the end of it, and I finally convinced myself that it was just my brain creating an elaborate lucid dream and that I was safe. I was convinced it should stop now, because it's just a stupid dream, and now that I know it, I have the power. I rolled toward my husband, facing his back. I closed my eyes and started to drift off to sleep. I swear it was only a few minutes later, and this time I couldn't see anything, but I felt the guy looking at me. This time though, while sitting in the chair that's three feet away from my husband's head, not the other one. I opened my eyes. No one was there. For the rest of the night, I probably woke up every hour or so. Every time I fell asleep, I could feel this man's presence in the room. He never tried to hurt us, he just watched us all night. When I finally saw daylight through the curtains, I got up and woke my husband up and I told him we had to leave. I tried not to alarm him or my son. I just got them up and dressed and said we were out. I think we were out of there by 7.30 in the morning. This whole thing had such a surreal quality to it, because with the exception of a few distinct moments, it was hard to tell when my eyes were open and when they were closed when I was fully conscious, and when I was maybe semi-conscious. There were parts that I could write off as a dream if they weren't so damn vivid. And the whole night, this lingering feeling of being watched, even when I couldn't see him, was so unnerving. Every time I recount this incident to myself or someone else, I'm no closer to understanding what happened. But I refuse to go back to that hotel. I've always been able to see, hear, feel, and communicate with spirits, but this particular one, during my Christmas travels, specifically spooked me. It's rare that I see people while I'm driving, but this thing looked blue, 
I don't know, like he had a blue light to him. And it was a man that was approximately 5'10", and I'd say around 150 to 170 pounds. I saw him on the side of the road going southbound on I-95 in Brevard County, Florida. He had on these loose, very worn-out Levi's and work boots. He was wearing a trucker cap and a loose t-shirt that I think may have been like a deep burnt sienna or a light brown. It was hard to tell because of that blue glow. He had brown hair and brown eyes and a brown goatee. Does anyone happen to know of anything that happened in the area with a man who matches this description? I just want to know who this is. I'm not a believer in the paranormal, and to be honest, I'm still very skeptical. But I'll share my experience anyway, because maybe it could provide some answers. I visited the Castle Museum in York, England. I specifically went there for a birthday trip, and me, being somebody who's obsessed with history, it was a no-brainer going there. The museum was fantastic, and I had a great time going through all the different floors and rooms it contained. About an hour in, we came across the prison section of the museum. Now this wasn't a huge prison, more like a dungeon than anything else. There were maybe about four cells on either side, all open for the public to wander inside and look around. Each cell was brightly lit enough to see where you were going, except for one. On the very far left side was a cell that had no lights, no furniture, no bed or tables or windows, nothing. It was pitch black and empty. So I decided that as a challenge, I would go inside and stay there for about 10 seconds. About five seconds in, I felt somebody go right up to my ear and whisper something. Unfortunately, I never made out what it said because I instantly panicked and ran out of the cell. Now my first thought afterward was maybe there was a speaker hidden inside the room, playing sounds to scare people. But unless the speaker was really just right next to my ear, I don't see how that was possible. My second thought was maybe a mischievous staff member or tourist decided to hide and scare us. But again, I would have had to have felt somebody leaning against me for how close it was in there. Sadly, I didn't ask a receptionist or anyone who worked there about that cell, or if there were any other reported experiences. I really wish I had. But I did do some research, and I found many stories and even some photographic evidence of paranormal encounters inside that prison section. So, either the darkness got to my head and I imagined it, or I am in fact another person to make contact with one of the restless souls who still wanders the museum. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. That was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking that we were the only ones on this road, and that we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was, and that was unsettling to her. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to it. We had separate rooms inside the cabin. 
The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then, my mother heard what sounded like footsteps, and she saw what looked like an outline of a hat through the window. There was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us were together and terrified. We thought that this man was going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed that was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep and then were awakened by an owl hooting. My mom could see the owl's eyes, which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. The owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long too. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her. The eyes really unnerved me. Neither of us could sleep. Every noise jarred us awake. It would be like, what's that? Did you hear that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of that hat walking around the general area and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out by this point, but we also weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were common. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning at that point. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but we left as soon as the sun came up on Saturday. A couple of days later, my mother got a call from the band director. Apparently, the man that we had seen was a mountain man who was a handyman who had been trying to get the power back on for us. He was harmless, but neither the band director or his cousin had told us that he lived out in the woods. Had we known this, we wouldn't have left on Saturday. He was the one that had told the band director that we left a day early. We can laugh about it now, it was a memorable night. That owl still freaks me out, though. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for around two weeks each to stay. I loved it. The smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but it also brings back horrifying memories. The ranch is located in Florida. Not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. Shortly after, the owners started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history as well as an unfortunate side in the front of the house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before. The land has several different ponds and trails, which made for awesome adventures. I had a lot of fun until my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At the time, I had no idea what made this pond so interesting. But later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound at the center of the pond, around 45 feet from the shore. It was perfectly centered from my understanding, somebody was buried at the center of this pond. Not sure if this is true, mostly stories and no real evidence. But anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I grabbed my small bait caster sized rod and began to hook a worm by the hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone as I thought it would raise my chance of catching something. But that day, Something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in it. I felt like a man with my rubber boots like my old man. About 20 minutes or so later, I noticed my bobber was going under and back up, 
so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So, in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in, and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. I'm not sure if this made sense, but it felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed, as though nothing had ever been on it in the first place. Even the worm was still hanging off the hook. Feeling proud, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line. This is where things got crazy. About a foot away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock. I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg. It hurt like hell. As I realized what had just happened, I went to pull my left leg forward, but I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around with my butt now in the water. I started to scream, yelling for my father. It was as if my scream fell on deaf ears. I was being pulled into the water by something. I didn't feel hands or anything actually on my foot. It's just that my leg was not free and I was gradually going farther and farther into the water. I was screaming bloody murder at this point, and after about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my foot let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father, screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come to me when I was screaming? My father, now shaking because of what I looked like, said, Son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't see you from the other side. I'm calming down a little bit at this point, and I ask him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, he just shrugged it off and said that my imagination had gotten the best of me. I never fished on that property again. Nobody actually believes it happened. They all tell me that I was caught on something or I made it up or it was all in my head. And I know that this is something that sounds outlandish, but something that I couldn't see had me that day and it wanted me. I'm not here to convince anybody, just to share. I was a kid. When I was a kid in the 90s, I would often sleep at my grandmother's house in the middle of a small village in the Jura region of France. The bedroom I would stay in was called the room in the back. As the name suggests, it was one of the last two rooms at the end of a main corridor shaped like an L. There wasn't anything special about that bedroom. It was pretty small and contained a bed, shelves with books, and some other very basic furniture. Yet, for some reason, that room creeped me out. I felt an unwelcoming presence, and I would always struggle to fall asleep, scared of whatever invisible forces seemed to be lurking in the dark. One night there, when I was around eight years old, I woke up scared and confused. I found myself lying down on the floor and in total darkness. I feel like I need to make two things clear here. This is the only time in my entire life that I have ever awakened outside of whatever bed or couch I'd been sleeping in. Second, despite the fact that the house is located in a small village, it wasn't particularly isolated, and the street lights outside would always let a little bit of light filter through the closed blinds at night. So here I was, a child, surrounded by total obscurity, struggling to understand why I wasn't in my bed, 
I tried my best to stay calm and touched around me, hoping to find the side of the bed nearby so I could climb back into it, but I simply could not find it. I tried for several minutes, but it just didn't seem to be there, which was extremely strange considering that the bedroom wasn't that big in the first place. I therefore decided to move forward in a single direction to find a wall, and then I could follow that wall until I found the bed. But things got even stranger as I tried to find a wall. I would bump into furniture that I didn't recognize, and despite all of my efforts, I could not find a wall anywhere. Everything around me was completely and utterly unfamiliar. I thought about calling for help. My grandmother was sleeping in the bedroom on the other side of the corridor, and my parents in the living room. However, I imagined them finding me screaming on the floor and decided not to, not wanting to face that kind of embarrassment. Finally, I fell asleep on the floor, giving up on finding the bed. The next morning, I woke up in that bed under the blankets. It was like the entire event had been nothing more than a weird dream, yet it absolutely did not feel like a dream. I am a natural lucid dreamer, and even back then I was already very familiar with how dreams feel, and this just wasn't one. A few years ago, a long time after this strange occurrence, I went to England to visit my aunt, who's from the other side of the family. She claims to be a witch and is into a lot of new age stuff. I've always been skeptical, but I have to admit that she's done and said a few strange things that got me to go from not believing her at all to being a little bit more neutral about it. We were talking about our respective families and she went on about the only time when she had ever been to my grandma's house when I was a baby. I thought it was a good opportunity to see if she had sensed anything unusual there and I asked her, making sure to keep the question open so as not to influence her. The first thing she said was, ah, yes, the room in the back. She said it in English and had no idea that we called it that way in French too. There is something wrong with that room, she said. I was spooked. Once I got back to France, I decided to confront my mother about it since she'd spent her childhood in that house. As soon as I asked her what was wrong with that room in the back, she froze and her face became white. She explained to me that when she was little, she went into that bedroom with a few friends and they tried to invoke spirits for fun. They sat down on the floor in a circle, holding hands and said, spirit, if you're here, knock three times. They immediately heard three very violent knocks and ran off, screaming. She told me that ever since then, the room had felt weird. That's it. Nowadays, the room is pretty different, but still used as a guest bedroom. It still feels weird, but I'd say a lot less so than when I was a kid. I know my brothers, who are 10 years younger than I am, have also complained about feeling uncomfortable there for some reason but they never had any unusual experience there. Just a feeling. When I was younger, in about the fourth grade, I lived in Germany. My father was in the military so we lived on the military base, and that is where I met my best friend at the time. Let's just call her MK. MK and I's parents noticed that we would always play together and we would have play dates. Eventually, MK and I brought our families together and we would all hang out. MK had two older sisters and a little brother, while I have an older and a younger brother. MK and her family lived off base in the local part of Germany so they lived amongst the non-English speaking, well, German people. Of course, the house MK lived in was old, really old. I would stay the night over there all the time. One night, for some reason that I can't remember, MK and I decided to sleep on the floor in the bedroom that she shared with the second oldest sister. Let's call her B. B was in the room with the oldest sister and let MK and I have the other bedroom to ourselves. 
So anyway, this night, we're sleeping on the floor a few feet away from their beds. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to the only light coming from the hallway. The door was open. My vision was blurry and kind of kept going in and out. I remember looking up at MK's bed, and on it, there sat a woman. I knew she was from the older times because she wore all black, and she had one of those bulky dresses and a black veil over her face. The way she was sitting, her peripheral vision would have been toward me. She sat up straight, both legs together, hands in her lap, as though she was in church. I guess she felt me look at her, because she slowly started turning her head toward me. I remember at that moment that I wasn't scared, but everything felt sad. The energy was sad, her face looked sad. She already looked as if she was at a funeral. Anyway, as soon as her face got all the way around to look at me, my vision went black, and the next thing I remember is waking up in the morning. I told MK and her sister about it, but I think they didn't want to believe me. I also think, though, that something told them I wasn't joking. I went back over there a few more times, because that woman, although creepy, didn't make me feel unsafe, and to this day, I've always wondered what her story was. I remember when I was a kid that every school was built over a cemetery. It was cliché. But my elementary school actually was built over one. Ever since I was a little girl, I was heavily interested in the paranormal, and I always thought my school had something weird going on. For some reason, I was invested in proving to myself that I was right. In the fourth grade, my experiments began. I purposefully stayed later in my classroom, hoping something would happen. I was always alone for like 10 minutes every day in the classroom, and I waited for like five minutes in silence to hear something. I was slowly getting frustrated and decided to drop my experiments. But one day, it happened. I was alone in my classroom putting some things away in my locker space as quickly as possible so I could join my friends on the patio. My classroom was at the end of the hallway on the second floor, so I was rushing to catch up. I could hear the muffled voices of the other kids outside. In one instant, it was like a crowd of people talking out loud just hit me in the ears. I couldn't understand a bit of what they were saying, but it was loud, louder than a bunch of kids playing outside. I grabbed my backpack and ran outside. When I was just by the stairs, I closed my backpack and walked to meet my friends. I was freaked out, but I didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't want a bunch of other kids to stay late in the classroom with me, and if someone told a teacher, they would think I was doing it for attention. Some weeks passed and I wasn't staying late anymore, because I didn't want to hear those voices again. One day, I thought it would be interesting to leave a piece of paper with a message for the ghosts hidden behind my books. I made sure nobody was there and that nobody could see it in plain sight. Sure enough, I received answers written on the paper. They were simple sentences, yes or no answers. Since my mom was a teacher at my school, I was the first kid to arrive at the classroom before anybody else would come in. I would open my message and I would see the answer. Eventually I stopped doing that because something about it just felt wrong and I could tell that the ghosts or whatever they were we're getting a bit annoyed. It wasn't much, but it was enough that it made me believe in ghosts and made me think that I was as awesome as the ghost hunters on TV. I started going to a new school in the second grade. The cafeteria was downstairs in the basement, and then there was a long, empty hallway that led to the two bathrooms. 
I remember the first time I went to the bathroom there. Nobody told me it was haunted, so on the first day of second grade, I ventured down the hall to go to the bathroom. As I made my way toward it, I kept hearing this noise. It was like, ooh, ooh, over and over. When I approached the doorway, so much negative energy hit me that I knew not to go in there. I ran back to the cafeteria, told some girls about it, and they were like, oh yeah, it's haunted. We were all terrified of this bathroom. The boys said that their bathroom was fine, but that the girls' bathroom down there also freaked them out, even to be near it. It got so bad that we had to have the principal come and talk to our class about it. Everyone knew it was haunted. Flash forward to third grade. It was Halloween, and I was the first student in the classroom. Every Halloween, we had a parade outside where we would all march around in our costumes. I began putting my costume on over my clothes and I noticed a piece of paper folded up on my desk. It caught my eye. I don't know how to describe it, but it was folded strangely. I picked it up, unfolded it, and in a faint handwriting was, if you dare go to the bathrooms downstairs, I'll kill you. I can't make this up. I was the first student in the classroom. The previous day, I had left school in line with everyone else. Once more kids came into the classroom, I told my friends and they were more scared than I was. They made me tell the teacher. You could tell that she thought it was odd, but she crumpled up the paper and threw it away. And that's the last time I saw it. I went in the bathroom again, but only in large groups. We used to have a thing called field day where we played outside all day at the end of the school year. One day on a field day, about 10 other girls and I had to go to the bathroom. So we all teamed up and went to the one downstairs. I remember leaning up against the wall and feeling and hearing something. It was like somebody was banging on the wall with an ax. We all heard it and it was uncomfortably loud. I also have to add that no one ever went into the last stall, but this day a girl did. I mean, it had cobwebs all over it and everything. Literally nobody would use it. Then one night I was at the school for a concert. This was toward the end of fifth grade, so I was brave enough to go there by myself. I was kind of curious. I went down to the hall and as usual, that ooh, sound could be heard a mile away. I went into the bathroom, but I just kind of stood around. I didn't actually go into a stall or anything. Suddenly, I just got scared and I ran toward the door, but I was rather surprised when I bumped into a strange lady with long gray hair, a scarf partially covering her head and face. I just brushed by her and ran. Also, the lights have turned off when I was in that bathroom. The energy in there is just insane. You just feel in danger. Girls would cry and sob because they didn't want to have to use that bathroom. The loud, overwhelming sound and the occasional banging noises, that unused last stall, the scratches on the mirror, the old poster on the wall, all of it was just creepy. That note might have been a prank, but that bathroom is haunted. Here's a bit of background. I'm from Texas and my boyfriend is from Maine. We both live in Texas now, in a decently sized city outside of Dallas. But during the summer, we attempt to escape the heat and visit his family in Maine for a few weeks. I've had my fair share of experiences growing up in a haunted house, so I was raised as a believer. Weird things seem to happen frequently but I don't like to automatically attribute it to a ghost or whatever. I like to think that I'm a fairly logical person and I like to try to debunk weird things. That being said, my boyfriend is pretty skeptical and doesn't spook easily, 
So that makes this story even more interesting. Around 11 p.m. one night, he and I were sitting on his dad's front porch and we were just chit-chatting. The porch is raised and looks down over a backyard that runs to the tree line at the edge of thick woods. We were just hanging out, completely sober, I might add, when we heard what sounded like an adolescent boy singing scales. It was just your typical la 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 la. It was just background noise, and honestly, we were used to living in an apartment so much in the city that we didn't really think anything of it. In fact, we were annoyed. My boyfriend actually said, do you think he knows we're here? That could be awkward. I laughed, and then I realized what we were listening to. We were hearing what sounded like a boy in the woods late at night, walking back and forth in the dark woods, singing scales over and over. My boyfriend was still bent on the idea that he should give the guy some warning that he had an audience. So he sang a tune of scales back to him. La 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 la. The same scale came loudly right from the trees. It sounded like whoever it was was instantly standing right at the tree line beside us. It was loud and it seemed that whoever or whatever it was had instantly covered a huge amount of distance to go from somewhere off in the woods to just a few feet away from us. We both instantly had that fight or flight response and without thinking or talking about it, we both jumped up as if we were going to run into the house. Something felt weird. We had flipped a switch from harmless, awkward fun to terrified. There's a house back there, right? I asked my boyfriend. There has to be, he said back. We were spooked and we went into the house anyway. We both couldn't stop thinking about it and suddenly the details began to sink in about just how weird this actually was. First, if that was an actual person, we would have heard them stomping around in the woods. The song sounded as if they were pacing back and forth over an area of about 20 feet, and the woods were thick. You couldn't walk through them without cracking leaves and twigs. Second, there were no lights through the trees. If that actually was a 12 or 13 year old boy, unless he has night vision or something, he would have needed a flashlight to accompany him, especially if he was taking careful steps so as not to make a sound. If there was a flashlight, we would have seen it through the darkness. Third, how did he instantly cover that much space to get right beside us at the tree line? I know that voices can be carried on the wind, but there was no wind that night. It also sounded enough like a real person not a floating voice on the wind, that we both automatically assumed there was an actual boy out there. Lastly, we asked his dad where in the woods his neighbor's house was. He just looked at us and said, I don't have neighbors. There's no house back there for miles. People in Maine don't tend to have close neighbors, but the next day we went back and checked anywhere and there was no sign of people anywhere. This happened to me when I was in the fourth grade. I moved into a new school. Someone once said to me that the stairs in that school were haunted. The story goes that one day some students were going down the stairs when they got pushed. A teacher just walked by and asked, what happened? Who pushed you? And at that exact moment, the teacher herself got pushed. Another story goes that this particular ghost was running around the hallway during assembly. Also, this ghost apparently had no arms or legs. I asked other people if this was true and they said that it was. So I got curious, and I decided to check it out with one of my friends at break. So to get to this supposedly haunted staircase, you had to go through a door. In front of that door is another door. Open that door, and the stairs are right there. 
My friends and I opened the first door and were about to open the second. But then I saw something, a shadowy figure that seemed to have no arms. My friend saw it too, so we ran out the back door to the playground. Now you might say that it could have just been a shadow of someone else, but the figure was standing right in the middle of the stairs, not against a wall or anything like that. I never used those stairs again unless I was walking with a teacher or a group of people. To this day, I still wonder if I imagined it or if that thing was really there. So, I just want to start out by saying that I'm some ways a skeptic. I generally call myself agnostic when it comes to not just religion, but anything supernatural or paranormal. For me, this means that I've vacillated at different points in my life all over the spectrum of belief, from times where I basically was willing to believe in anything, to being about as hardcore of a skeptic as you can get. These days, I'm in a weird place somewhere in between. I still feel like I live in the mundane material world, but there's something so much bigger and weird peeking right over the horizon. The main thing that keeps me from having a 100% skeptical outlook is that I've had my share of very weird experiences. Not as weird as some people's, but weird enough that they have me questioning what is real. I should note that I'm not the most mentally stable person, so some of it can be chalked up to that. And at times thinking I'm just crazy is actually the most comfortable option. But also, I've had plenty of experiences that I have shared with others as well, and those are a lot harder to dismiss. I know shared delusions or hallucinations are possible, but they're exceedingly rare from my understanding and mostly limited to just two people who are extremely close, like siblings or spouses. Some of my experiences have been backed up by as many as four witnesses. This is one such experience. A number of years back, I acquired a house through my family. I won't bore you with the details, but it was through some pretty weird and convoluted circumstances. The house itself is very strange looking inside. I'd best describe it as something out of Alice in Wonderland meets Black Lodge from Twin Peaks. Lots of weird angles, oddly sized rooms with no clear purpose, and decorating that looked like it came from someone who had only read about humans in a book. More spiritually oriented folks who visit would variously claim that it had a vaguely sinister or dark feel to it, while others would say it had a light and inviting energy. I'm not sure I put much stock in any of that, but I suppose it's worth noting. The really weird stuff started early on. Within the first couple of months, my housemate and I kept finding weird bits of writing all over the place. First, it was seemingly just names, all kinds of random personal names. Although the handwriting was neat, we figured it must have come from the kids of the family who lived there before us. But maybe it's worth noting that most of it probably wasn't them. At least they weren't writing their own names, as the family that had lived there spoke Spanish. Most of these were decidedly not family names of theirs. For instance, there were names like Gertrude and Siobhan, and we know that they don't have any of those in their family. We found about 15 of these names, at least, and only seven people lived in the house before us. So, even by that count, some of them couldn't have been theirs. I suppose it's possible that the kids might have just been scrawling random names that they knew for some reason. But then we started finding other stuff, like whole sentences tucked away under countertops or on baseboards, and eventually, even on our furniture, stuff that wasn't even in the house before we got there. The sentences were never really threatening or anything. They were just strange and mostly nonsensical. Sometimes they looked like song lyrics, but they never came up as anything when I tried to Google them. Also, to be clear, the fact that we kept finding these random scrawlings made zero sense 
because sometimes we would swear that they had shown up in places we'd already looked before. Almost like more of them were being made, and yet they all looked very similar in handwriting. A little wavy and childlike, but overall neat, neutral, and legible. This was starting to feel more and more like the beginning of some stereotypical horror movie, but it still wasn't weird enough to really freak us out. Yet. We also had lots of stuff go missing, usually only to turn up later in really strange places that we were sure neither of us had left it. But again, nothing too out there. There were some minor poltergeist-like activity early on too, objects that seemed to jump off of fixtures on their own. There were pretty consistent electrical issues as well, including a microwave that we had to keep unplugged because it had this habit of turning itself on. But probably just faulty wiring in an old house, right? No. You see, things really began to ramp up about a year after we moved in. I had gone on a road trip for about a week, and I didn't get back until nearly 4 a.m. When I did, I was greeted by a strange little nest of dried grass with three roughly equally sized but differently colored stones sitting in front of my front door. This was weird, but I assumed it was something one of my roommates had put there for some reason or another, and I didn't think too far into it. The friend that I had been traveling with noticed it too when she was helping with bags, and found it odd but just like me didn't think much of it. So the next day, I casually asked my housemates what was up with the little bed of grass and the rocks, and they were all confused. Each of them had assumed that I had put it there. At this point, I assumed either my roommates or a friend of mine was playing a prank on me. A really strange prank, but a prank nonetheless. With this assumption, I did the whole, okay, nice one, you got me assuming that at least one of them would confess to their not-so-clever prank. But all of them insisted earnestly that they had no part in it, and they continued to insist this for the rest of the time that I knew them. I'm inclined to believe them, as none were really the pranking type. They would definitely have admitted it under duress. After all, it was about as harmless a prank as you could get. Any of my friends that I confronted said the same exact thing and never let up. Really, the only friend I could easily imagine coming up with such an odd, abstract prank was the one that I had been on a road trip with, so there was no way she had done it. I am absolutely certain that it was not there when I left, and all of my roommates said that it wasn't even there the day before I got back. So really, that just left the possibility of it being the work of some random prankster in the neighborhood. But there are problems with that too such as the fact that these stones got moved and put back exactly the same way on multiple occasions, until the whole thing creeped me out enough that I finally took them inside. This did stop them from being put back again and again, but maybe it was a mistake if you believe that they were perhaps tied to something. Who knows, I guess. On top of that, I asked our incredibly nosy next door neighbor about it once, like if she'd seen anybody on our porch. She said no, but she'd keep an eye out. To be clear, she was retired and kept an eye on things at all hours that she was awake. And she was a light sleeper. So this prankster would have to be continually coming back in the middle of the night to set these rocks up with cat burglar-like stealth over and over again immediately after they were disturbed. Unlikely. But it gets even weirder. The poltergeist type activity ramped up, and eventually it led to stuff like the bathtub turning itself on in the middle of the night when I was the only one home. I have no history of sleepwalking or anything like that. Then both me and at least one of the other roommates started getting woken up in the night by mice except both of us swear by all things holy that when we occasionally caught glimpses of these critters, they were weird, like really weird. They were incredibly pale, hairless, bipedal, and tailless. But granted, we only ever caught brief glimpses of them because they were incredibly fast, faster than typical mice. 
and seemed to make great effort to stay out of the light or out of the open. We also both suffered strange, vivid nightmares and heard voices. And while for me this wasn't completely unusual and could even be chalked up to mental illness, my roommate had no history of anything more severe than depression, had never taken any substances beyond weed and alcohol and was hardly into those, and was completely sober during these experiences. Yet she apparently suffered so much from them that she eventually moved out. There was some other stuff like the house getting a lock mysteriously put on it by a property firm who didn't own it. Like I said, my family owned it. Nobody at the property company had any knowledge of who might have done it, and whoever did it apparently did so in the dead of night. Because, again, my neighbors hadn't seen anybody do it while they were awake. Maybe it was just professional incompetence. Who knows? Other things started showing up on our porch over time, like bundles of twigs and a sprouting sweet potato, rotting fruit. I'm reasonably sure that it was not the work of anyone I knew. And after all of that, my neighbors surely would have seen at least one of these instances. Anyhow, I no longer live at this house, but I've been thinking about all the odd experiences that I had there lately. And while they're maybe not the weirdest or hardest to explain, they always struck me as both oddly personal somehow, as well as oddly senseless. The only reason that I've ever thought they could be the fey folk or fairies isn't because of the conclusion that I personally came to, but because I spoke to a friend of mine who's way more into esoterica and paranormal stuff than I am. She immediately assumed it was old school trickster fairies. This friend did have a bit of a personal connection to the whole Fey realm. She actually claimed to have been abducted by them when she was little, but that whole thing is not my story to tell and we don't have time. I will say though, although this girl held some metaphysical beliefs that I'm not quite on board with, she never struck me as an out and out liar. She certainly experienced something strange and traumatic when she was young and never even wanted to talk about it with most people. Still, she was right about the fact that certain aspects of the whole thing really do seem to evoke the weird and fickle nature of mythological fae. Maybe we even glimpsed them, but who knows? Anyway, if you have any idea as to what this could have been, or if you agree that it was the fae, let me know. I'd love to hear some ideas. To this day, it was just the most bizarre experience and I've never come up with a good explanation. For about two months, weird things have been happening. I've been living in this house since 2000 now. My parents built it. It's only 22 years old. I'm from Bavaria, Germany. About one month ago, while I was laying in bed at about midnight, I heard knocking coming from the hallway ceiling. It knocked twice, and it sounded like there was a lot of force behind it, because the ceiling made crackling sounds. A few days later, I was laying in bed, and I was nearly asleep. Suddenly, I heard a childlike voice whispering behind me. They were whispering, stint, stint. It's a German word for right, all right, or I agree. I was super scared, but I didn't dare turn around. Last night, I was woken up by three loud knocks. A few seconds later, the same three knocks came again, just a little bit more silent and gentle. At first, I was kind of half asleep and half dreaming. But suddenly I realized this knocking was not from my dream, but it was from above me, maybe in the attic. And suddenly I was 100% awake and scared. My heart was beating out of my chest. I lay there for about 10 minutes without moving. I looked at my phone to see what time it was, 2.57 AM. I couldn't sleep for two hours, but I didn't hear anything else. All the knocks that I heard so far cannot be wind or water pipes, 
They really do sound human. I have no idea what this could be. My wife and I bought our house almost three years ago. The very first night while we were there, we were laying in bed about to fall asleep when we heard a loud knock on the kitchen floor. It was like something very heavy had fallen. We jumped out of bed to find nothing. We hadn't even unpacked anything. Over the next few weeks, we would hear the doors in our basement open and shut. Several times I would get up and go down to the basement to see if anything was out of the ordinary, but nothing would ever be out of place. We have a completely finished basement, and it's not creepy or anything like that. Over time, activity would mellow out and then ramp back up again. My wife and I would both, on occasion, catch somebody standing in the kitchen as we walked by the kitchen door. But when we did a double take, nobody would be there. Most of the activities that we experience take place during the day, so I don't think it's just us being spooked by the dark or something. My children have had many strange occurrences too. I was in the kitchen one day and my son was sitting on the stairs to the basement. He jumped up and ran to me saying, the bad man's in the basement. I asked, where? And he replied, at the bottom of the stairs. Being a rational adult and not wanting our three-year-old to be afraid, I decided to walk him down and show him that there was nothing to be afraid of. We found no one. A couple of weeks later while I was at work, my wife and kids were home alone. My wife was in the bedroom and my son in the living room playing trains. All of a sudden, my kid screams and runs into my wife shouting, the bad daddy is in the kitchen. My wife looked, but nobody was there. Sometime later, my wife and kids and I were in the living room watching TV while the kids played. Both my son and daughter stop at the exact same time, look at the kitchen, and follow something there with their eyes down the hall into a bedroom, back down the hall and through the kitchen. We were sitting there watching both of them track the same thing that we couldn't see. Another time, the four of us were in the kitchen planting seeds for our garden in the little seed starter trays, when our daughter stops and looked at the doorway to the basement. She smiled and said, are you playing in the basement? She was two at the time and spoke clear as day to somebody that we could not see. Other times we would hear our kids talk to somebody when they were in their rooms completely alone. One Sunday morning while watching football, I was sitting on the couch with my back to the bedroom door, which was open. I decided to get up and make some breakfast. The door was open when I walked into the kitchen when I came back, the door was closed. I thought it was odd, but I just sat back down and continued to watch the game. After a while, I got back up to go to the bathroom, and I noticed that the door was opened halfway. When I returned to the living room, it was shut again. The rest of the day, I sat in the chair adjacent to the couch so that I could have a full view of the door. We've had many strange encounters, these are just the few that I can think of off the top of my head. The activity seems to be picking up again, and my wife wants to sage again. I try to be rational and remind her that this is a 70-year-old house. There will be noises. But as a skeptic, I find it hard to be skeptical with the amount of activity we have here. This story happened a few years ago. I lived in a building with my daughter, who grew attached to my neighbor's husband, Teddy, as if he were her dad. One day, while talking with my neighbor's wife, my daughter, who was two and a half years old at this time, came running to the door. But rather than running into my neighbor's apartment to go cuddle up Teddy, she froze at the doorway. 
She told his wife and I that we needed to be quiet as Teddy was sleeping. Teddy was not sleeping. He was, in fact, sitting on the couch watching TV. Teddy stood up and called for my daughter to come see him. Again, my daughter looked at his wife and I and told us that Teddy was sleeping and that we needed to be quiet. I could see she was getting upset at the fact that we were laughing while telling her that Teddy was awake and wants you to go sit with him. Teddy started approaching the doorway where we were standing. My daughter began to cry and ran into our apartment screaming, no, Teddy is sleeping. I could feel the goosebumps running across my body. That same day, my daughter went to a relative's place for a sleepover. I had invited my neighbors to come over for a bit and Teddy came over and explained that he wasn't feeling the best. He said that he was breathing in and out of a paper bag before coming to my apartment. I insisted he go to the hospital to make sure he was all right. On the way, Teddy fell ill and asked to pull over so he could be sick at the side of the road. As he was kneeling beside the car, Teddy suffered a major heart attack and passed away while on the way to the hospital. When the service was held for Teddy, I had such a strong feeling that I had to bring my daughter with me. She brought her favorite blanket with her, of course. When my daughter and I got to the funeral home for the viewing, we were greeted by everyone in Teddy's family. They all knew who my daughter was, as Teddy used to talk about her all the time. I held my daughter close as we walked up to the casket where Teddy laid. My daughter leaned down, almost as if she was going to whisper to him. She then told me, See, Teddy is sleeping and he's really cold. She took her blanket and tucked Teddy in, then looked at me and said how he was warm and happy now. That night, as I sat alone in the living room, my phone began to ring. Four or five rings later and still no name appeared. I quickly answered the phone in the middle of a ring, only to hear the dial tone. The call didn't even show up as an incoming call afterwards. It felt like Teddy had called us to say goodbye. It was so strange that my daughter knew there was something wrong with Teddy before anything even happened. A few months later, we went to go visit my grandmother, who was passing away from pancreatic cancer. My daughter refused to enter my grandmother's room. She kept saying how my grandmother was sleeping and that everyone should leave her alone to go sleep. I instantly began to cry. Only four days later, I got the call that my grandmother had passed away in her sleep. Several months ago, I lost the last pair of glasses I had. I remember the last place that I had them, which was my friend's car, on my knee. I have to take them off in order to see my phone. I couldn't find them after I got home. I tore my house upside down looking for them. I even looked in the driveway, thinking that maybe I still had them on my knee when I got out of my car. I called my friend to look in his car but nothing. They had just vanished. Fast forward to last week, my husband and I do yard work for an elderly man, and we haven't been to his place to work in close to a year. He was out of state during that time, dealing with trying to sell a house out there. Anyway, we went to do his yard work last week, and my husband was taking and pulling weeds in one of the flower beds. He yells for me to come and take a look at something. I get to where he is and he's holding in his hands my glasses. He had just uncovered them buried in a flower bed. There's no possible way for them to have gotten there, much less to be buried under the dirt. I've been so shook over this and I would love to hear any ideas on how this could have happened. We're pretty sure it's some kind of glitch in the matrix, but dang, it was super weird.
The last hour of my life has been really surreal for me. So I got off work just a little while ago and I ended up on Instagram, just kind of browsing the reels. I do this every now and then just for filler and it almost felt like my hands were just leading the way. Well, I ended up on this video of some girl and I liked her style, so I went to her page. I was just watching a few of her videos. For whatever reason, because I never do this, I clicked the comments, and I ended up clicking on the first commenter's profile. As soon as I do, I see the pictures of this person. I look up at the name. This profile belongs to a long lost friend of mine that I went to elementary school with. I went to school in a very small town. My sixth grade class had fewer than 10 students. I haven't used Facebook in over six years, and even my Instagram doesn't have my real name attached to it. But when I found their profile, I instantly added them and sent them a message. We had no mutual friends, and they actually lived in another state, and had for the last 10 years or so. We messaged back and forth, and I found out that they had been having a hard time recently, but that they were trying to stay positive. I also found out that we both had similar outlooks, and we agreed that we were supposed to find each other again. I plan on calling them again this weekend to catch up more thoroughly, but holy crap, what a beautiful thing. Still, it seems like more than a coincidence. I don't know if it's a glitch in the matrix or something like that, but it was wild. When I was in my 20s, my then wife and I were standing outside a bakery waiting for it to open. There was also a family behind us in line, a father, a mother, a young boy, and a girl who was a little older. I remember the little boy because I thought it was odd that he was playing on the rounded metal railings on the opposite side of us, just climbing and hanging off of it like little kids do. The boy had brown hair and an oversized winter coat on. Nothing was said between my wife and I, and when the bakery opened, we went in, and so did the family. Except, there was no boy. I figured he was roaming an aisle or something, like kids do. So we check out and so does the family, but still, no boy in sight. We walk out and get into the car, and notice the family leaving with just the daughter. I wasn't really thinking too much about it, until my wife says to me, Where's the little boy? That's when I was a little shocked. We discussed the boy and what he looked like and how he was dressed, and we also talked about what he was doing on the railings while we waited. But there wasn't a boy anymore. This is a little bakery off a highway with no other stores around and no houses. The parking lot is also small and in plain view of the only entrance and exit door. We were both a little spooked, and we're not entirely sure if it was a ghost or some kind of glitch in the matrix. Like, maybe we were seeing two different timelines or a parallel universe or something. But in any case, that boy just glitched out of existence. This isn't exactly a horrifying story, so don't get too disappointed if you're not terrified. For background, I'm a 15-year-old Irish fella called Ross. I go to school in Ireland, and I'm now in third year. At the start of the second year, I knew a fella that joined the school. I was in charge of showing him around, and we've been good friends ever since. He is Portuguese, and his name is Tiago. I'll call him Tig for the story. His school bag is a fairly small, bright red bag. He's a little bit shorter than me, and his hair is quite short and brown in color. One day, I was upstairs in my school. It was break time, and I was going to my group's usual spot. I turned a corner, and I saw Tig walking along the hallway. This was weird, because at the distance I was from him, I would have seen him come up the stairs. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I sped up to catch up to him. There was another corner coming up, 
He rounded it, and I followed suit. Except he wasn't there. There was a staircase going back down and two bathrooms. One for lads and one for lassies, but no Tig. Considering how close behind him I was, he would have had to have sprinted towards and then jumped down the stairs or jogged into one of the bathrooms. If he went for the stairs, I would have heard it. So I figured he was in the bathroom. I sat at the bench and waited. Tig was the first other person in our group to arrive. He rounded the corner and set his bag down. The realization hit me hard. He wasn't in the bathroom, and whatever or whoever I had followed was not Tig, even though it looked just like him. Same backpack and everything. I asked him if he had already been up there, to which he replied he hadn't. He had no reason to lie. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was someone else. First of all, the person that I saw looked the exact same as my friend from the back. Second of all, no one else in the school has that bag. At least I've never seen anyone else with it. And third, the only place the person could have gone without sprinting down the stairs, which I probably would have caught a glimpse of anyway, would be the bathroom. No one ever came out of the bathroom. At least nobody that I didn't watch go into it. Finally, my friend is a fairly distinct character. Not many people have the same body build as he does. Like I said at the start, it's not exactly terrifying, but I do believe it to be a glitch in the Matrix. I don't know if this would be a glitch, but I sure as hell don't have any other way to describe how or why this happened. My best friend and I are driving down this windy road in our town that has a speed limit of 45 miles per hour. We have the windows down, the music up, and we're just talking and laughing, all the usual things. I believe we were on our way to a mutual friend's birthday party. On this one specific part of the road, there's a relatively sharp turn that bends around a guardrail. If you were to drive through the guardrail, you would plummet a great distance before hitting the shallow river below. Mind you, I have been on this road countless times, and I have never been paranoid or imagined anything specific about this turn. It was just one of many places on this particular road that you had to slow down a good bit before continuing your way around nothing major. We start to approach the turn, and while in the middle of a discussion about some drama going on at the party we were on our way to, we both grab the sides of the seats, her one hand remaining on the steering wheel. At the exact same time, in the middle of a conversation that had nothing to do with the road. We weren't speeding, there were no cars around us at all. It was just a peaceful drive, not unlike any we've had previously or since. We glanced at each other with big eyes and pulled onto the side of the road after making it around the turn. After stopping, we immediately bring up the exact thing that we both pictured in our heads at the same exact time. She loses control of the wheel, which results in us smashing the guardrail and plummeting over the edge directly into the water. We both felt the same sensation of not being able to breathe correctly until we pulled the car onto the side of the road. And we felt a tingling sensation in the back of our head, a weird buzz in our ears. We both experienced the same exact thing at the same exact time, never happened to us before or since. It was, to say the least, extremely bizarre. I don't think I'll ever be able to make any sense of this experience, and I was on edge the entire night after this. I would love to hear any ideas on how or why this occurred. Let me preface this story by saying that when this happened to me, I, a 33-year-old male, was barely 16 and was as much of a skeptic or a believer as any kid at that age could be. I'd had other unexplained incidents before this, 
but this is the one that really stuck with me most of all. I went to bed in my very boring, very normal mid-2000s bedroom. I played a little Nintendo DS, later than I should have on a school night, I'll admit, then slept for maybe an hour or two before waking up in desperate need to use the bathroom. I roll out of bed, not bothering to grab my glasses. My first mistake, as someone who's literally legally blind without them probably should get them. And I take the muscle memory four steps diagonally across my tiled bedroom floor. I am a very tactile person due to my visual impairment. And I had my whole house, not only my room, memorized to a T for safety. I reached for my doorknob and I get nothing. Okay, so maybe I'm not quite as awake as I thought. This never happens to me though. I wake up if one of my parents so much as breathes wrong across the damn house, but okay, I guess I'm groggy. I reach to the left since I must have angled my walk wrong. Nothing. I try right. Nothing. Did I not walk far enough? I feel really awake now. I take another step, regretting the no glasses choice. I can barely make out shapes in the daytime, and darkness is just a blanket over my eyes, so I can't see my door, or my bed, or my own hands in front of me. I can't see, period. But the door should be there. So where is it? I take another step. Two, three, four. I flail my arms forward, silently pleading, please let my door be there. And I swear I can see the nightlight in the hallway that's there so that I won't eat carpet on my way to the bathroom. Thanks, mom. But no matter where I reach or how far I go, I can't get close enough. My memory gets hazy here. But after maybe two solid minutes of aimless walking toward the hazy outline of light around a door, my last thought from that between time was feeling that I was not at home. Then I'm in the hallway and I sleep on the couch the rest of the night. Looking into my room felt like staring into an abyss. Nothing ever came of it, but I don't know if anything will ever get under my skin the way this did. I felt so unsafe, so helpless and alien in that space that I had known so well. Wherever it was, it was not my room. When I was six or seven, we moved out to a ranch in the countryside of Laredo, Texas. Not a lot of people with good income lived out here. Most houses were isolated and surrounded by woods. My mom and stepdad decided to rent this house because the rent was cheap, only $350 a month. No indoor plumbing or central air. A lot of low-income families lived out there. There was a family that lived next to us a family of six kids, all girls, and two adults. They were also low income and often didn't have much to eat. My mom would often help them out with food. In return, the kids would come over and help my mom clean the house. This one day, they came over and ate dinner with us, helped my mom clean, and the youngest girl and I that was about my age fell asleep on my bed. After a while, my mom woke us up because it was getting late and she needed her to go home. Her sisters had left her behind because they didn't want to wake her. It was a good walk to her home as there was a dirt road leading to our house to get to hers. My mom was going to send my brother to walk with her, but I butted in and said, can't I walk her? We're friends. My mom said yes, so I walked her to the gate. We departed and I started on my way home. Out of nowhere, she comes running behind me, crying, and throws herself at me and pulls me down by the shoulders. 
I asked her what was wrong, what had happened. She points up and says, look, look up there. She was pointing up at the top of some abandoned train cars. And to this day, I can't explain what we saw. There were three skeletons walking back and forth. I was like, what the heck? One was laying on its side and it had clothes on too, like a tank top and shorts. The other two were standing up, just walking back and forth behind that one, stopping and waving hi. We looked at each other and ran to my house. I quickly told my mom what we saw. My mom and two brothers plus us went back to look and they were still there, just waving hi at us. We threw rocks at them, but it didn't even phase them. It just went through them. Either that or we were bad at aiming. After a while, we went home and never saw them again. Till this day, I can't seem to understand or be able to explain how those skeletons were moving. Some will probably say that we were hallucinating, but how can five people see the same thing? Some have said it was Halloween props, but it was the 90s and I'd never seen any Halloween props that moved that well during that time. The technology just wasn't there. Plus, Halloween props like that would have cost a lot of money, and that family couldn't even afford to eat. We were in a dirt poor area of the country. There's no way anybody had animatronic skeletons. When I was pregnant, my kid's father and I stayed at his cousin's house for about a month before we moved into our apartment. It's an old farmhouse in a newly developed area of Warwick, Rhode Island. There are farms and woods in one direction and a small town in the other. We were told when we moved in that the house had been built in the mid 1800s, which to me was super interesting. Until my kid's father, let's call him Brian, remarked at how the stairs seemed awfully dark and creepy for the middle of the day. And when I looked, he was right. It gave off such a sinister vibe. We slept in the living room at night and could see through the kitchen, and it was as if the stairs became a dark, uncomfortable void. When we brought this up to Brian's cousin and his wife, they proceeded to laugh and tell us stories of people being pushed down the stairs. I don't think they believed in ghosts, and the husband was an abusive drunk, so they had a lot of problems going on. That house was chaotic. The husband and wife clearly were having some serious issues, emotionally and financially. They had a six-year-old son who was afraid to sleep upstairs by himself because the shadows scared him. Great. After being in the house alone a couple of times, I saw genuine human figures out of the corner of my eye. Even better, black dots on the floor with what looked like long spindly legs would run around, but whenever you would look at them straight on, they would disappear. A few times I would see a figure out of the corner of my eye. I would go to look and see one of the family members who I hadn't heard come in. I think that freaked me out the most because how can you explain to yourself seeing a person and sometimes nothing being there. But other times, you expect it to disappear. But that time, it would in fact be a person standing there. It was so weird. Brian would say how sitting in one chair in the living room, you'd want to look over your shoulder into the doorway, as if somebody was coming down a set of stairs that used to be there. This also freaked me out, considering I slept right near the doorway, and often would get a feeling of somebody coming toward me. One day, Brian and I were the only two in the entire house. Facing one another about two feet away, face to face, talking loudly as we usually do, we hear directly in the middle of us a woman's voice say, Shh. I asked if he had said that, and he stared at me with huge eyes and asked, No, didn't you? Then we laughed it off because clearly we were talking too loud for the inhabitants, apparently. We eventually brought this up to the family, who included a second cousin living upstairs, and they confirmed that they too saw and felt things. 
They told us they assumed the black voids that ran on the floors were just one of their dogs and ignored it if it wasn't. The cousin who lived upstairs said that the curtains to his closet often moved as though they were being pushed aside, but he had chalked it up to just being tired. There was no breeze. The wife told me that when they first moved in there, her son would see a man in a hat, but she had always assumed that it was just his imagination. I mean, how could you live in a house so clearly haunted and just pass it off? I'll never get it. The front of the house at night was avoided by basically everybody, as it was right where it felt like somebody was walking by the door frame. It felt like the person was coming right at you into the living room. One night, I didn't feel like walking all the way around this huge house to the car, so I walked as fast as I could to the car through the front door. I heard a deep growling coming from the side of the house. They owned three dogs, one of which was a bull mastiff. Too freaked out to call for her, I ran in and, to my horror, all three dogs were in the house. Needless to say, I didn't use that entrance again. It was such an emotionally depressing house, and maybe me being pregnant, I was just more aware of everything. There were other weird things, but one of the last conversations I had with one of the roommates renting a back bedroom was about Brian and I hearing that shh. She explained that she hears the exact same thing in the hallway if she and her son are getting a little loud. She was just sure it was the owner's young son sneaking into the hallway, but I'm not so sure. We bought a house intending to use it as our second home, but after just a few months, we decided to sell it after some unusual experiences. Long story short, we're pretty sure it's haunted. Our real estate salesperson and the person who bought the home are both aware of the claims and have made an informed decision to purchase it anyway. They probably think I'm nuts. The home is not an old one. It was built in 2019 and we are the third owners. We've gotten an air quality test done in the home, and both my husband and I have both received physical examinations. Nothing is out of the ordinary. We bought our winter home last year. Originally, we're from Canada, but we've spent the majority of the last couple of years between the United States and, more recently, Costa Rica. My first experience there was while I was taking a shower. The house has an ensuite washroom, when you enter the room, if you go to the left, you'll go toward the bathroom. If you go to the right, you'll end up in the bedroom. From the shower, you can see the entrance to the bedroom. One afternoon, while I was showering, I watched my husband walk into the bedroom with a glass of lemonade. I then turned around to wash the soap off my face and turned back toward the door to rinse the shampoo out of my hair. That's when I saw my husband enter the room again with the same glass of lemonade. When I exited the shower, I asked him if he had re-entered the room a couple of times, and he said no. He'd only ever come into the bedroom once, and that he'd been there the majority of my shower. My husband had a similar experience. He was in the backyard looking into the kitchen. He claimed that he saw me leave the kitchen and walk toward the mudroom. He was very confused when he entered the house to find it empty. I had been out for a couple of hours. On multiple occasions, I've heard the sound of my husband's car scraping on the driveway. We have the steepest driveway on the block, and every time he parks the car, you can hear this distinct dragging sound of metal on the driveway. Whenever I hear this, I usually unlock the garage door. There have been multiple times where I've heard this sound, unlocked the door, and he isn't home. We've both heard whistling sounds that we can't explain, that stop once we acknowledge it. I guess it could just be the vents, but for the last three weeks, our thermostat hasn't been working, and we still hear it. There have been other trivial occurrences. Once I woke up in the middle of the night because the fridge door alarm was going off. 
We also have one of those annoying automatic toilets where the lid lifts when it detects motion. Well, those keep going off on their own too and opening up. I understand that with modern upgrades, there are going to be some malfunctions. So I put those experiences under the questionable category, but there's still been quite a lot of them. We've spent the past week packing our things. We're one of those people that just don't store anything in the garage other than our vehicles. The only other thing that we have in there is the water softener tank, and that's it. So one night, the car alarm goes off on both vehicles. Convinced that we're being robbed, we call the police, and of course, the neighborhood security also comes by, just to see that our cars are perfectly in the garage with no signs of an intruder. We officially moved out of that house three days before closing. We couldn't bear another day there. The neighbor texted me to ask what all the commotion was at our house. I told her that I had no idea what she was talking about because we don't even live there. I know this sounds insane, but we have lived in so many houses and we've never experienced anything like this. Even though our house was built in 2019, it was a teardown. There was another house on the same property that was built somewhere in the 60s, I think. So who knows what we might have inherited from that. This happened sometime near the end of seventh grade. My aunt, my brother, my cousin, and I were all visiting our grandparents' house in Washington State. They lived in a pretty remote area with only a handful of other houses around and a good chunk of forest between each of them. Keep in mind that it's also kind of an island, so they don't get many funky creatures out there. My aunt and I went out while it was still dark outside, just walking the path in the forest and trying to figure out what was making this loud sound. It wasn't necessarily a weird one. It sounded like a normal forest noise. I said frogs, she said crickets. I was right. Anyway, we pass this pond area and we make our way to a clearing. I don't know if this is entirely relevant, but the clearing was a bit small with an apple tree in the middle. That's where my brother and cousin and I would hang out whenever we were outside. Whenever we reached the clearing, I immediately started to get a bad feeling. I figured, you know, it's dark. I'm typically terrified of the dark, and I'm tired. It's just me. Nothing is really going to happen. The path was a bit overgrown around there, so we decided to turn back. Right before we did, though, I caught a glimpse of what could have been a really big owl up in one of the trees, just staring at us. Now I'm an Arizona girl, so I don't know what creatures are normal in the forest, but this thing just didn't feel right to me. It just like gave me this weird vibe. My aunt kept walking and I caught up. Keep in mind, the path was pretty short and it only takes about 10 minutes or so to get to the clearing and a 10 minute walk back. But when we got closer to the house, we heard my grandma yelling for us. We run back to the house to see what's wrong, and she says we've been gone for hours. We swear we'd only been out for at most a half an hour, and when my brother and cousin come back, they tell us that they had been out searching for us, worried sick. We check the time, and they were right. Another interesting thing that could be connected, a few days before that, we had heard some really weird noises coming from the woods when we were out making s'mores. Even my grandparents, who have lived there longer than I've been alive, admitted that it was unlike anything they had ever heard before. It kept getting closer and closer and stopped any time somebody tried to get a video of it or capture it on recording. Eventually, I had to go inside because it was freaking me out so badly. I'm sure that everything in this story could be explained but the time loss thing still gets to me.
So I'm a skeptic, and I don't really believe in anything supernatural. But today I had a weird experience I can't explain. I have a galley-style kitchen. I was washing dishes, and my phone was on the counter behind me. I was listening to some Mr. Revenant stories. I turned around from the sink to grab another container to wash, and noticed that my phone had gone from the video to the comments section of the video. I looked closer and noticed that it was queued up to reply to a comment. A message was already written in, but hadn't been sent. It said, I am in danger, all lowercase. My phone automatically autocorrects I'm lowercase to I'm with an uppercase, so I was really confused. It's possible, maybe, that a water droplet from my dish gloves flung onto the phone when I reached it, but I don't think it could type a whole message. After I checked on my husband, I called my mom and texted my brother. Everyone was fine. About a half hour later, when I went back to the kitchen, I was momentarily overcome with nausea and felt sweaty, but it passed after a few minutes. I have no idea what that was. I didn't feel like I was the one in danger. Maybe just a strange, unexplainable glitch and the nausea was unrelated? Or it was a message from someone, but I can't think of who it would be. I scanned my phone for viruses and malware and I didn't find any. I don't know anyone personally who would want to hack my phone. I'm basically a hermit. I have agoraphobia and I work out of my house. I haven't received any weird texts and I don't have any apps that I didn't download myself. It's still possible, I guess, but it doesn't look like my phone was hacked and I don't have any other explanation. I'm a part-time custodian for the town that I live in, and I only work when I'm needed. I have pretty much worked at every school in the district, including the middle school that I attended. It's a fairly old school, built in the early 60s, and is actually being torn down in about a year to make room for the new middle school that will be replacing it. I love that school, and I never want to see it go, but it's kind of a dump. But every time I get the opportunity to go back and work there again, I always accept it. I have always been a firm believer in ghosts, and I've had a handful of experiences, but I've never experienced anything at that building before until last winter. I was working a three-night stint at the old middle school on the second floor, from about 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. Quite frankly, I didn't need seven hours to go about the nightly routine of cleaning, but I was fine with that. On the first night, I went about my business knowing I could pace myself, but I was still flying through my work. I'm not overly social when I work night shifts. I actually like them better because most people are gone by 5 p.m., and I can just have my headphones in and listen to music, podcasts, or whatever. It was probably about 5 p.m. when I was sweeping the classroom floors in the science wing. All of the doors were shut and locked, which is mandatory in the science wing, with the lights shut off in the rooms, meaning that all the teachers had gone home for the night. Now this detail is important. I have a system when it comes to cleaning rooms, and it's very simple. When I've done everything that needs to be done in a room, I shut the lights off in that room. But when I know that I have to go back into a room for whatever reason, whether it be a stain on the floor that needs to be mopped or a rug that needs to be vacuumed, I leave the lights on in that room as a reminder to circle back at some point. There was one room in that wing that needed a wet mop pretty badly, so I left the lights on and the door open. And I figured that when I was cleaning the bathroom floors in that wing later on, I would make a stop in that room and give it a quick mop. At this point, it's probably about 7 p.m., and I've just finished taking a break with my coworker Jeff, who works on the first floor. I go upstairs to my closet and gather my bathroom cleaning supplies. About 30 minutes later, I make my way back to the science wing to clean the bathrooms and that classroom floor. When I get down to the classroom, I notice that not only is the door shut with the lights off, but the door is locked. 
Now I know this wasn't me. I never close the classroom doors until I go around to shut the hallway lights off at the very end of the night, just in case I need to go back into a room. I'm also positive that no teachers were left in the building. I unlock the door and the lights are flipped in the off position, so I flip them back on. I immediately ran downstairs to ask Jeff if he had been in the science wing at all in the last hour, and he said no. I asked if there had been any teachers meeting in the main office or the teacher's lounge, and the answer was also no. I told him what happened, and he wasn't surprised at all, saying he thinks that building is haunted. We talked for another minute or two, and I went back upstairs to the classroom. And what do you know, the lights are off again. I always try to debunk every experience that I have, but I cannot for the life of me think of anything that would have caused these things to happen. It was the middle of December, and the building was always cold, so there were no windows open, and I made sure of that. I have no explanations for the light flipping off twice, and no explanation for the door locking on its own. I walk around the entire upstairs, looking in every classroom, trying to find any sign that some teachers could have still been in the building, but I found nothing. I went back to mop the classroom floor and finish the rest of my work for the night. Night two was uneventful, but night three, in my opinion, was the most eventful. The whole night, I had this feeling of somebody watching me, and not your normal feeling of being watched, but more like I was being followed especially once all of the faculty and students were gone. One could normally chalk this up to paranoia, but this feeling only worsened. I thought I heard footsteps around me a few times. Not heavy footsteps. They were more like light shuffling. I ended up back at the science wing bathrooms. Now these bathrooms are faculty only, and the doors are always shut. They both open just simply by pushing on the door, no knobs or levers to turn, but the women's room on the left doesn't normally shut all the way. It stays propped open on its own about half an inch, unless you forcefully pull it all the way closed. I always start with the men's room on the right. I go in and out of the boys' room a few times to grab things off my cart. At one point, I open the boys' room door and take two or three steps in when suddenly the door to the girls' room slams shut. It wasn't just a normal slam. This was loud to the point where I jumped and I don't scare easily. I go back into the hall and the door is all the way shut. I open the door to the girls' room, certain that nobody's actually in there, but just to be safe, I do my normal, hello, is anyone in there? Custodial needs to come in, with the door just cracked open. No response. I open the door fully, and both stalls are open and there's nobody inside. I lean back into the hallway and I shout for Jeff, thinking that he's somehow pulling a prank on me, slamming the door and then running into a nearby classroom or something. But then it occurred to me, these bathrooms are pretty far removed from any classrooms in both directions. If it was Jeff or a kid or anybody playing a prank, I would have seen them. A few seconds after shouting to whoever may have been listening, I swear I heard faint whispers. The problem was, I couldn't tell which direction they were coming from. It was like they were all around me. I asked them to speak up, and they suddenly went silent. I must have spent ten minutes playing with that door, trying to figure out what could have caused it to slam so hard. There are no windows that could have blown it shut and the only vent in the room is on the other side of the room, and it doesn't blow hard enough to move the door with that kind of force, if at all. I quickly finished my work in the bathrooms, and I swept the hallway floors so I could finish up for the night. Once I was finished, I took one final walk around to shut off any classroom lights and lock any doors that might have been left open. I also went to shut off the hallway lights. While doing this, I made sure that I did not have my headphones in. If something wanted my attention, I was going to make sure they got it. Nothing happened while I made my final rounds upstairs, so I went downstairs to find Jeff. 
I asked him about the bathroom door slamming and where he was around that time. He told me he was in the sixth grade classrooms by the kitchen, which is on the first floor and on the opposite side of the building. He also said that he had never experienced the bathroom door do anything weird before, but then again, he never really worked in the upstairs wings before. I walked with Jeff, talking to him about random stuff as he went around shutting off the lights. It's probably around 9.15 at this point. Yes, we were there a little late at this point, but we didn't really mind. As we made our way down near the music wing, something urged me to look back down the hall from which we'd come, so I did just that. I turned to look, and I still get chills and smile like a madman when I think about what I saw. I saw a dark gray transparent figure, shaped like a person, walking from left to right down the hall toward the gym. I immediately start running down the hall to try to see it again. But I played it off to Jeff like I thought I saw a real person and was going to direct them out of the building. But I know what I saw. There were no people in the building. There were no basketball practices, no extracurriculars going on that late, and there should have been absolutely nobody else in the building at all. I turn the corner and I don't see anybody. I check all the bathrooms, and there's no one. I checked farther down the hall, around the corner, and there was nothing. I looked outside to the front plaza, but there wasn't a soul. No people, no cars, nothing. At this point, I honestly got teary-eyed, but not because I was upset or scared, because I was happy. To that point in my life, those were the most intense experiences I had ever had with the paranormal. I firmly believed that someone was trying to contact me over those three days. Jeff and I finished up and went home. I have since been back to that school a handful of times, but unfortunately I have never had any truly great experiences like I did those three nights, other than the shadows that we all sometimes see out of the corners of our eyes, but who really knows for sure if those are spirits. They were nothing like the walking figure that I saw, so I chalked them up to my mind playing tricks on me. But like I said, who could be sure? The woman who normally works the upstairs wing of that school doesn't believe my stories. She's worked there for 11 years and says she's never experienced anything in that building before. But she's also one of the most closed-minded people I've ever met. She doesn't believe in ghosts and won't even ponder the idea of aliens or life outside of our planet. She says that I only saw what I wanted to see and that my experience was what I wanted to experience. Quite frankly, I think that's bold. My theory is that since I was clearly interested in what the spirit or spirits were doing, given that I would spend significant amounts of time trying to debunk my experiences, they tried to keep my attention almost like they were all starved for attention. I also think it's possible that since I was in a middle school, the spirit or spirits may have been those of middle school aged kids, and they were probably just doing juvenile pranks to mess with me. When I called for the voices I was hearing, they went silent. Kind of like how students sometimes do when they get yelled at for talking during a test or something. It's all a theory, but I think those ideas make sense, and I hope that they make sense to whoever's hearing this. I know these aren't the scariest encounters, but they're very near and dear to me. Like I said, I've always believed in ghosts, and I've had some smaller encounters with what I believe were ghosts. But up until that point in my life, those were the most intense encounters I'd ever had. I've had some more encounters recently, some at another school that I believe is haunted. And maybe I'll tell those stories sometime. But for now, I'll leave it here. So I dated somebody who owned a cadaver dog. Basically, they can find dead bodies. It was a new term to me when I met them. Anyway, they explained that they worked with rescue teams. We live in wilderness country. The dog's job was to sniff out bodies for people who might have gotten lost and died, 
who were buried under avalanches, things like that. After five months of dating, my now ex asked if I could house and dog sit. Was more than happy to. Great dog. I would be dog sitting for two weeks while they visited family. I was warned that it has happened on hikes before that the dog might pick up the scent of a corpse, and the person that I was with at the time gave me the steps I should follow if that happens. The first couple of days were pretty uneventful. Then one day the dog is dragging me down this trail, and I'm panicking, because I'm like, man, am I going to see a dead body? But the dog stops at this very stern woman, just sauntering along. He keeps looking back and forth between me and the woman. She gives me a quick, your dog isn't well trained, and keeps going. I had to drag him away. It happens with the same woman a few more times, so I call the owner to bring it up. I describe the woman, and my ex is shocked and confused. Fast forward to my last night dog-sitting. I was going to bed and had this horrific nightmare of being held down in bed by the woman. I hear a bark, and I wake up. The dog is standing next to me on the bed, in its alert position, staring at the bed. I didn't get any sleep that night, and I never got an answer. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said that he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who, what you see, is what you get, and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said that he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons that he barely hunts or scouts alone, if he can help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so that he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day, he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell, with him still clueless on whereabouts he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was just pitch dark, so much so that his little flashlight didn't give him much light at all. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking about where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he might have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing that if it was, he needed to get the hell out of there, but to not be hasty about it, so as to spook it. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping that he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him a distance away. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up. My dad starts walking faster, and as you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now maybe a couple of yards behind him, Scared out of his mind, he turns around and shines his little flashlight to see nothing except these huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead and everything around it was dying with each step. He starts freaking out and straight out sprints, not caring which way he's going. He just wants to get as far away from whatever that is as possible. The footsteps behind him are following suit, sprinting after him. He only glances back once more, still seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass, leaves, and things like that wherever they had landed. 
By now, he's not sure how long or how far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that somebody can help him if he's come upon a house or a store. He breaks out of the woods and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on the porch. The lights outside are on. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading her Bible at the time. It's embarrassing for him to admit now, but he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks, and she stands up and looks behind him. That's when she sees the hoof prints and hears the sounds herself. She holds her hand out to him, and he grabs onto it tightly. She pulls him to her and then says loudly, You can't have him. He said that the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder, so when he looked up, all he could see were the hoof prints and the dead grass and leaves. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that he was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that his grandmother saved his life that night.